Mary. This conference will now be recorded. I'm super excited um, to be with all of you today. Um, I'm, I like uh, Mary said, I work for NASA as part of the Artemis communication team, and I am at Johnson Space Center, which of course is in Houston, Texas. Um, and there are ten different NASA centers all around the United States, and, and each of them have a different role within the Artemis program. And uh, a lot of the programs at Johnson Space Center revolve around astronaut training and getting our astronauts ready for uh, future missions. And so it's a really awesome place place to work. So I wanna um, kick it off by, by showing you a video to kind of get us in the spirit of what the Artemis program is and, and what it, and the type of people it's gonna take to, to get us back to the moon. So we'll begin with that. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science and that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with that last gentleman, that is uh, Gene Krantz, who was the flight director during Apollo 13. Um, and and uh, and so super excited to have him a part of that of that of that uh, that movie or that film that we we made for for all of you to see. So I want to um, start a little bit um, and share with you my journey. For those of you who came in a little bit early, you got to hear hear me talking about it. But I started working at. Space Center Houston, which is our visitor center for the Johnson Space Center, kind of like a museum um, for, for NASA um, in the year 2000, so when I was in college. And I met my husband there, and after I finished getting my degree in education, I never left. <laughs> I stuck around and worked in their education programs for almost 10 years, about nine and a half years. And then in 2009, I, I got the opportunity to come and work at the Johnson Space Center in their education office. And I, I worked in a program that doesn't exist anymore, but it was called the Digital Learning Network. And we had uh, several studios um, on site there at NASA. And we spent our days teaching science lessons and doing um, live events um, on NASA TV and other educational programming, um, introducing students to astronauts and the different missions that we were working on. It, it was pretty cool. Um, I even got the chance to float and do um, some videos for NASA and the reduced gravity plane. Um, and so um, there's no way to turn off gravity, obviously. Gravity never goes away here on Earth. So we use a plane where we do parabolas. We, there's also a, a nickname for this plane called the Vomit Comet. And I got the chance to, to float and work with some teachers and then also film some videos. It was pretty cool. And then in 2014, I transitioned from our education office at NASA and started working um, with our, we didn't have the name Artemis then, but it was what we called our Exploration Systems Development Division. So it was the development division of NASA that was getting the vehicles ready for our future lunar and Mars missions. Um, and in the last couple of years, it, it then transitioned into the Artemis program. So my current job is, um, like she mentioned in my bio, I spend a lot of time um, working with museums and other informal education groups, sharing NASA's resources, helping them um, come up with exhibit ideas and integrating our activities and programming into, um, into their everyday you know, programs and, and, and community um, service that they do um, within your city or your state. So, and then I also get to travel a, company, a con country um, doing outreach for NASA. So it's, it's pretty fun. So those are just some fun pictures of, of what it was like before COVID. <laughs> this is what it's like during COVID. I do a lot of virtual um, engagement since we're not able to get out and, and with the public. But hopefully that will change soon and I can do a little bit of both, continue to do the virtual engagements, but then also get to be around people again. 
So let's talk about Artemis. Um, Mary gave a really great um, just snapshot overview of, of the purpose of Artemis. Um, Artemis is our new human lunar exploration program, and it will send the first woman and the next man to the moon in the next couple of years. So it's really exciting. Um, and the big difference, one of the many differences between Artemis and Apollo is we are going to the moon to stay. During the Apollo missions, it was the space race, a technology race, so this big demonstration that the US had greater technology than the Soviet Union. Um, now, when we go um, to the moon, we are going with international partners, um, industry partners, and we want to go to have a permanent presence um, on the moon so that we can prepare for Mars. All right, so uh, if you ask me why are we going back to the moon, there's so many different answers I could give you. Um, it really depends on your priorities. And so we'll just go over a few of, of some of my, of, of my favorite reasons to return to the moon. There's all sorts of valuable lunar science that we'll be able to do. So the scientific community at NASA and outside of NASA is super excited about exploring a different area of the moon. We're going to the South Pole this time instead of around the equator, which is where we went during the Apollo missions. And I like to tell kids, imagine if you were an alien visiting Earth for the first time and the only place you went was New Jersey. Is that a good representation of what our entire planet is like? You know, it's no, of course not. And it's the same way on the moon. Going to the equator, just in those six locations near the equator during Apollo, isn't going to tell us everything we would love to know about our moon and our Earth moon system. And going to the South Pole is a great place because we know that there's water in the permanently shadowed craters. It's a great place to study the solar system, set up telescopes. I mean, there's just so much that we can, that so much that we can learn. If you ask my team on the human exploration side of NASA, we are excited um, to use the moon as a test bed for Mars. Um, the moon, of course, has lower gravity than Earth. It doesn't have an atmosphere. It is a hostile environment, and we are going to have to bring and develop all sorts of technologies and capabilities to keep our astronauts safe. And so we want to test those habitats and rovers and environmental control systems. And how do we fix things when they're broken? Can we figure out how to live in lava tubes in the moon? Or are we going to live above the ground? You know, there's all kinds of things that we want to test and, and make sure they work really well only a few days away from Earth before we send astronauts on a nine month journey to Mars where they are pretty much on their own. Um, there's not really much NASA can do it for them in an emergency. And so um, being able to establish an Artemis base on the South Pole is a great place to prepare for Mars. So here's a look at a time lapse video of a full year on the surface of the South Pole of the moon. And uh, if you if you look at the video, you'll notice that there are craters that are permanently shadowed all year round, which means the sunlight never, never gets um, never gets to them. So we know that there's water ice there based on our satellite imagery. Um, and then the rims of the craters are almost in constant sunlight, which is what you want for a base with humans, if we're gonna use solar power as our, our main means of, 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 of a power source, and having the sunlight is important. So it's a great place to explore. And so I see a question that popped up about our international partners. That's a great question. Um, we have a few. Uh, we have the European Space Agency as our main partner for our first couple Artemis missions. And then later on down in the later Artemis missions, our same partners that are with us on the International Space Station will be joining us to the moon. So Canada, Japan, Russia, um, who am I missing? And the Europeans, Australians are, are interested in supporting us and, and partnering on surface exploration. So we've got a pretty good list of, of countries and it's growing um, as, as we progress. Great question. <clears throat> All right, so let's, I oh, forget my key doesn't work that way. All right, so from here, that ah, it's stuck. There we go. Um, I always like to throw up this chart because I always get questions about um, how does this rocket compare to that rocket? Or why can't we use this rocket to go to the moon? Or why do we have to build a new rocket? And this chart kind of helps understand that process. So when NASA develops um, rockets and spacecraft, we have a saying, mission needs drive design. If the mission need is to go to low Earth orbit um, to the International Space Station, then you design a rocket and a spacecraft for low Earth orbit. There, it would be too expensive and, and, no, and not smart at all to develop a really, really robust, heavy spacecraft and rocket just to go 250 miles above the Earth. So these rockets have the capability just to go to low Earth orbit. If you're going to the moon, your low Earth orbit rockets and spacecrafts are not going to cut it because, look, your temperatures are greater on the return. 
to over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. You're now traveling at nearly 25,000 miles an hour, and you are three or four days away from Earth on, on the moon. So your spacecraft have, have to have new capabilities. They have to have more robust redundancy systems. You have to have a more powerful rocket to get us away from Earth's gravity. And then same thing for Mars. So with each type of mission, you design based on the missions and, and, and the capabilities you need to keep your astronauts alive. So if one of you is going to ask me, well, why can't we use a Delta Heavy to go to the moon? Why can't we use a Falcon to go to the moon? Why can't we use, a, you know, whatever other rocket that you can come up with? None of those rockets have the capability of getting to the moon. Now, uh, there are industries and companies that are working to develop these vehicles, but none of them are ready and none of them will be ready um, in the next couple of years. So that's why NASA has been um, been working really hard um, on our vehicles, the, the government vehicles that will get us to the moon um, in the next couple of years. And we will hopefully have other options from our industry partners and other rockets and spacecrafts. But for now, th these will be the backbone of our Artemis program. And the new rocket is called the uh, Space Launch System. And to answer your question, yes, those temperatures are the reentry temperatures. Yes, they're pretty, pretty high and pretty extreme. So um, the Space Launch System rocket is um, a rocket that we've been working on for quite some time. It is now finished. <laughs> it, it was a qualified to be sent over to Kennedy Space Center to be assembled just a couple of weeks ago, which is really exciting. Um, the Space Launch System is built by our industry partners, but it's a government vehicle. So like SpaceX and Blue Origin and those other places, if NASA wants to use their vehicle, we buy a service from them. In this case, the way the procurement and the contract went is NASA had the requirements, we had what we wanted, and then um, we send out um, procurements out to industry, and then we choose the company we feel will do the best job. And in this case, the Boeing um, company received the contract for the core stage, which is the big orange part of the rocket. Uh, Northrop Grumman has the boosters. Um, Airjet Rocketdyne is building the, the or is using or built the four main engines or the four SR25 engines at the bottom, and Lockheed Martin it builds Orion, and along with like thousands of other smaller suppliers. <clears throat> and so with this group, uh, we've got our, our transportation system, we've got our Space Launch System rocket, which will be the most powerful rocket I've ever built. It will be pow more powerful than the Saturn V rocket, and it will grow um, and evolve based on our capabilities. We're going to need to be able to take really heavy and large cargo to create, to build bases. And so we'll have that capability as the SLS evolves. So here's a look at where the core stage is right now. And in the next couple of weeks, it will leave Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, and it will float down the river on a barge called, the barge is called Pegasus, to Kennedy Space Center. Um, and that core stage would then, will then um, be added to the boosters, which are already being assembled right now. Um, so it's super exciting. The Orion spacecraft is the crew capsule. And if you are familiar with Apollo, which I'm sure most of you are, um, it is a very similar shape. It is not the same size, it's 30% larger, but that teardrop gumball shape is the perfect shape when it comes to re-entering the atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour. There just really is a better shape, um, an aerodynamic shape to, to help deflect and, 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 and survive those really, really fast speeds and high temperatures due to friction. So the crew module is here, and it's 30% larger than um, the, the um, Apollo, rock, Apollo spacecraft, and it has really great sophisticated um, touch screens as well as um, analog buttons for the astronauts, it's, and it has an exercise capability, a bathroom, which didn't exist during Apollo. They just had to do their business in bags. So it's, it's, it's much more modern. Um, the the uh, service module, which is the back end of the Apollo spacecraft, is built by the European Space Agency and their contractor Airbus, and that will be the power horse of the Orion, and that will give it the in-space propulsion and the uh, power capability using the solar panels. And then the top part is the launch abort system, um, which is the same type of system that we use for the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo rockets that would yank the crew capsule away from the rest of the rocket during launch if something was wrong. All right, <clears throat> the Orion is already finished. It's been sitting at Kennedy Space Center for many months. It seems like maybe four or five months now, waiting on the, the remaining pieces of the Space Launch System to be tested. And uh, we are assembling everything right now in the, in the Vehicle Assembly Building, the same building we assembled the Saturn V rocket and the Space Shuttle rocket. 
And here's a picture of what the boosters look like right now. Um, the solid rocket boosters are the same type of boosters we used during the space shuttle program. We had several left over. They're just a segment taller to give the additional thrust needed to get um, higher up in um, the away from the atmosphere of Earth. And then we'll deliver that core stage. And hopefully by the end of April, you will see that core stage there at Kennedy Space Center, and then we'll get it inside and, and get it assembled. Um, our goal is to have that first launch um, at the end of this year. Looks like I'm having trouble. Give me just a second. All right. Can you guys still hear me? Can you somebody message me in the chat? Okay, good. All right. And my whole computer went blank for a second. I'm not sure what happened. All right. So let's move on. Um, someone had a question about how is it funded? So the, um, the all of NASA is a, a federal agency, which means it's funded through your taxpayer dollars. Um, NASA receives less than half of a percent of the entire federal budget. So if you want to check out how exactly how much money and what how much Artemis gets, you could check it out on um, online, but yes, we are funded through through taxpayer dollars. Um, all of NASA is. Great question. All right, so let's move on, and hopefully my computer doesn't go black again. All right, so this is another look at Kennedy Space Center from a different perspective. Um, here is our mobile launcher. So the way that it, it all works is you will. Um, when we're when we're building and assembling the rocket, we build it and assemble on the mobile launcher. So once it's sitting on top of the launcher, then we just drive it out to the launch pad. And the launch pad is that those towers, those three um, lightning towers you see in the back right here. That's where the launch pad is. And it it, it takes many hours to get it there because it only drives at about one mile an hour. It's pretty slow, but that's how we get the rocket um, and the launch pad to and from um, the building. And then um, the Orion spacecraft will splash down um, um, in the, the Pacific Ocean, much like we did during the Apollo missions, and then it'll be retrieved um, with the assistance from the Navy. So this next slide, I believe, is our little video of Artemis 1. So hopefully that's working. Okay, good. All right, so Artemis 1, like I said, is going to be our first, and this launch will take place um, our goal is to get it done by the end of this year in 2021. And um, and the purpose of Artemis 1 is a, is a test mission, right? We have not launched this rocket before. Um, and so we want to launch it and we want to make sure the Orion is a safe spacecraft and the space launch system is a space is a safe rocket. And so we're going to do that um, here at the end of the year. Uh, and after this first mission, then we'll you'll start to see crewed missions with our astronauts. But the video is moving really choppy, so I'm thinking we're having some bandwidth problems with team uh, with um, GoToMeeting. But I'm, so I'm going to skip it a bit. Um, so the engines at the bottom of the rocket are SR25 engines, which are the same engines we used during the space shuttle mission. They they are just operating at peak efficiency. Before we didn't need them to um, to work at peak efficiency because we weren't going. Um, high, you know, we're only going at about 200, 250 miles above the Earth. But now we're going to use them at, at their peak capability, which is really exciting. And we have 16 left over from the space shuttle. So they're all being refurbished and updated so that they can be used for the first four missions. And it's just not looking great. So I am going to stop it. And at the end, I will put the link to the video in the chat so you guys can watch it later because it looks like we're having some bandwidth problems. All right, so that's Artemis 1. Um, and then about a year and a half to two years after Artemis 1, we will have Artemis 2, which will be our first crewed flight. 
And our first crewed flight um, is super exciting. Um, it won't be to the surface of the moon because uh, we always want to get that one last mission, that test mission in using our Orion with crew before we land on the surface. And it's a lot like um, Apollo 8. And so Apollo 8 did a flyby of the moon and then they came back. And that's what we're going to do with Artemis 2. We'll have a full crew of four inside the spacecraft. They'll do a kind of like a figure eight a flyby of the moon, use the gravity assist to come back. And then, um, then that next mission for Artemis 3 will be the big one where we land on the surface. And, um, and we'll have a, a better idea of when that date will be probably in the next six months. Once we know exactly when that first Artemis mission is gonna launch and we know that we are gonna do it by the end of this year. And then we have a better idea of our assembly of our other pieces for Artemis 2 and 3, we'll be able to an announce a, a date. And you'll probably hear that in the news in the next six months. All right, so in addition to our vehicles um, to get us to the moon, we also have to have a whole host of, of technology and vehicles to, for us to live on the moon. And so the human landing system is the really big hot topic and hot um, the hot topic and the hot uh, piece of hardware at NASA right now, because we are about to announce um, the final two contenders for, for our contract. So in the next um, week and a half, two weeks, NASA is going to take the three companies that you see here and narrow it down to two. And so we um, accepted three proposals in our first round of the selection um, for human landing system ideas. The first with Blue Origin and a Blue Origin has a team um, that includes Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and Draper. And then our um, second team was Dynetics and then SpaceX. All three were awarded funds to, uh, to continue their um, development to a certain point. And then now we're at that next stage where NASA will then down select to two. And those two companies will continue on with their um, development until NASA then chooses one that for that first mission. And that doesn't mean that these other companies won't ever have a landing system that has flown, but NASA can, can't fund all three at a full capability because we just don't have the, the funding to do that. Yes, and speaking of money, do the international partners contribute money? The answer is yes. Um, just like um, just like the space station, it's kind of a pay to play, um, you know, timeshare kind of situation. All of these those international um, uh, space agencies contribute te technologies, capabilities, science in some cases, money, you know, so they work out these really big international agreements with these um, international um, government agencies um, to determine how we're all going to work together. And a, a lot of that's already kind of been outlined in something called the Artemis Accords. So if you're really interested in learning how NASA <clears throat> will work with our international partners, you can Google the Artemis Accords and there's a PDF. You can read all about it if you want. So um, back to human landing systems. Yes, yeah, so I'm super excited. So in the next two weeks, we'll know who those next two, um, those, those two uh, companies are. And um, we'll have a better idea of exactly what those vehicles uh, will look like and what the capabilities are. It's super exciting. Um, another piece of the Artemis that's really essential to the sustainability part is um, the Gateway. And the Gateway is an orbiting spaceship, an orbiting platform, orbiting outpost. It has a lot of names. And those or orbiting um, uh, outposts around the moon is going to allow us a, a stopping point in our missions before we go to the surface. So you launch on the Space Launch System and with the Orion. Orion flies through space and then connects to the gateway, which is an orbit around the moon. And then from there, the astronauts can get out, so they can prepare for their next part of their journey um, to go to the surface of the moon. And that's where the lander would be. And then they can go to with the lander to the surface of the moon. And then when their mission's done, they can come back out to gateway and then get ready for their return home in Orion. Um, we could also use it as a stopping point to Mars and we could pre-position our Mars transit vehicle, which would be a much larger vehicle than Orion because you're going to be in it for nine months. It can't be that small. We could have that pre-positioned um, in orbit around the moon attached to the gateway and astronauts could then leave from there to go um, to Mars. So it's going to be a really important uh, piece of, of us living in and around the moon, um, hopefully from the foreseeable future. 
And we I talked about those international partners already, but here's a look at how we can use them to grow. Um, right now, the gateway consists of a few pieces. And I noticed that someone says it looks like the ISS. So it may look like the ISS, but it's not even close to the same size. The ISS is the size of an American football field. This is so small. So um, it, it will consist of a very small power and propulsion element built by Maxar. Northrop Grumman is building a very small habitat. And then you have the logistics module built by Gateway. That's it. That's how it will be for a what, quite some time, just three small pieces. Um, and we plan to grow it with international partners. Um, and so like the, can the Canadians are interested in building a, a Canada arm like they have on the space station, you know, building a robotic capability. And then other um, countries are interested in doing more science in orbit around the moon so they could contribute a laboratories. So we hope to grow it. Uh, if that probably won't be exactly what it looks like, but th that's kind of a concept image of, of what it could be at, if, as we get more partners um, in, in, with the Gateway program. So here's a look at what the surface, um, some of the concept art for the surface operations. That lander, of course, is just a concept. We have no idea which company's getting it. So NASA created just a generic lander. Um, we've got new spacesuits that are in development right now that are being tested. Uh, we're super excited about those. Um, and then we've got two different kinds of rovers that are being built. We have an open concept where you would have to wear a spacesuit like the one you see in the picture. And then there's also one that's a closed pressurized vehicle um, where astronauts could go on longer journeys um, and then have a, a pressurized cabin to sleep in and spend you know, a few days away from their habitat. So those are in development right now too. There's also all sorts of tools and science um, and science that's that's going to happen. And NASA is working with all of our geologists and, and our scientists um, and to figure out exactly what types of science and samples that we want to return home with. And uh, some of our missions to the moon will start off of just being a few hours. And then as the next one will be more hours, then we'll get into days and eventually weeks. And then the goal is to have an actual base, a lunar base, we're calling it Artemis base, where you have habitats and astronauts hopefully will be living on the moon for a year. That's kind of our goal for a checkout mission. So if you ever hear anybody say, you know, it's we're, we're gonna have a checkout mission on the moon before we go to Mars. Um, what they mean is we wanna have people living on the surface of the moon for a full year and be able to be semi, you know, autonomous and be able to handle when things break and fixing things, we're working out, you know, logistics and supplies, we're working how to, you know, to get all of our technology to work the right way. When we can do that for a year, then we'll be ready for Mars missions. So for a long time, people would say like the 2030s for Mars missions, um, a lot of that would have to depend on funding and if NASA's budget is increased because the farther we go, the more expensive the missions get. And so um, in order to make a 2030 um, Mars landing, there would have to be a significant increase in NASA's budget, which I don't know, it might happen, but my gut says you, humans not on the surface of the of Mars until the 2040s, but we don't have a date. So you can't ask me for a date because we don't know. All of that has to do with how successful Artemis is, what we've learned, and then how much money NASA continues to receive um, from Congress. All right, here is Mars, right? That's where we're going. And uh, and everything that we do with Artemis is gonna prepare us for Mars. It's the perfect place to learn. We're only a few days away. Um, if, if astronauts get into trouble, it's a lot easier to help them when you're only a few days away instead of you know nine months away. Um, and we have learned so much about Mars um, through all of our um, landers and our rovers and even our satellites. And so this is a great graphic of the evolution of a Martian, right? These are all of the rovers from Shorejourner, which um, and Pathfinder, which were in the early 1990s. Then you have Spirit and Opportunity, and then you have Curiosity, and then now you have um, Perseverance, and then the sample return that Perseverance is going to shoot off uh, and have hopefully an orbit around uh, the Mars, so then we could um, future missions can go and bring back those samples. Uh, people don't realize that we don't have any rocks or soil from Mars. We haven't ever had a, a sample return before. We have meteorites that we believe were from Mars, um, but no, but no actual rocks. And so um, we're, we're hoping to get some samples, hopefully, before you know, in the next you know five five to ten years, we'll see.
And then here's a great concept image on what the surface of Mars looks like. If you've watched The Martian, it's a pretty good representation of what it would look like, although the wind isn't going to be so strong that it's going to knock poor Mark Watney off of his ladder. That would never happen. The wind is not that strong on Mars. But, um, but a lot of the other things that you see in the movie are pretty accurate. Um, so it's I always tell kids, if you have any grandchildren or children of your own, um, the children who are in elementary school, middle school are going to be that Mars generation. They're going to be the group of people that are really pushing the envelope and getting us ready for Mars and maybe even one of those first uh, Mars astronauts. And so I always like to end with imagine if you were on the surface of Mars right now and you look up at the night sky. That is what Earth looks like, that tiny little speck in the sky in 39 million miles away from your home world. So it really puts it in perspective how hard these missions are going to be. And so when someone asks, well, why haven't we gone yet? Well, if we could send people to Mars, but we wouldn't be bringing them home. And NASA is not interested in having a one-way trip to Mars. We want to bring our astronauts home safely. So we are going to use the Artemis program as, as a way to learn and prepare so that when we do have astronauts look up, um, into the night sky on Mars, they know that they're going to be able to, to come home and they're going to have a, a, a really exciting um, mission. All right, so for those of you who do have any children or grandkids that are interested in being a part of NASA, these are my last two slides. Um, I always like to point out all the different types of jobs we have. Like here I am, an education background doing public and communication outreach for NASA. You know, so we have a lot of non-STEM careers, but of course the majority of people who work at NASA have some sort of engineering or science background. Um, and a lot of them start off as interns um, in college. We have a great internship program for, for students and, and great collaborations with many of the universities in the United States. So it's a great place to, a great way to get um, experience and make connections. We um, are, our uh, skilled workforce is super important. So those who do um, electricians and welders um, and people who do construction, NASA utilizes these skills to build our vehicles and to get our launch pads um, ready to go. So that skilled workforce, um, which people sometimes call, you know, the blue collar, which I think is a silly name, but but those those skilled um, workers are super important. Um, and they're the ones that get to do a lot of the hands-on um, fun building of, of our vehicles. Um, and so we there's a great need for those types of jobs. Um, and then, of course, we have our mission control folks who ha usually have engineering backgrounds, and there are great problem solvers, food scientists, people who have um, chef and, and food science background are creating different types of foods for our, our astronauts that have a long shelf life and that still tastes good. Um, folks that do communication, social media, spacesuit design, lots of geologists and planetary scientists right now, um, robotics, lots of artists. Believe it or not, there's quite a few artists at NASA. All of those really great um, pictures and videos that I showed you are all part of our multimedia team, um, our artists at NASA that create great products to share NASA's story. And then lots of different kinds of astronaut trainers, from someone to teach astronauts how to use the toilet, to how to take blood, how to do IVs in space, how to give CPR in space, to astronauts trainers that teach them how to do spacewalks in our giant swimming pool. So lots of different opportunities. And that is it. That is my presentation. And so I'm going to stop sharing. Let me find the right button. All right, perfect. And then I see a couple of questions I have already in the chat. Let's look here. All right, so target dates, like I mentioned, target dates are hard. Um, Artemis dates are a lot easier. We're looking for 2021, 2023 timeframe for Artemis 2, 2024, 2025 for Artemis 3, and then having a launch about every year from that point. Um, Mars, late 2030s is would be amazing if that actually happened, but most likely 2040s. But you're not going to find those kinds of dates online on the NASA websites because we really just don't know. Those are all just best guesses. Um, so as far as China, so uh, yes, NASA is very much aware of what all of the different space agencies and international space agencies are doing. Um, as of right now, NASA does not work with China, just like the United States does not work well with China. So we can only do what is is best as for our national security. We have to be really careful about um, those kinds of things. And so right now there, are, there is no collaboration between China and the United States. Um, what do I think about them going to Mars? I think it's great. You know. 
whoever wants to go to Mars, if you can get there and you can have a successful mission, um, I think it's great for humanity. Um, and who knows, maybe it'll even spark a bit of a space race between between NASA and China. I don't know if that will happen or not, but um, the more people and the more countries that are excited about space, the better I believe it is for everyone because all of the technology um, development and great advances in science that come from the space program, uh, the, the more people that do it, I, I feel is the better. So are there any tweety, treaties between countries legislating land uses on um, the moon? So there is an international agreement for the moon and it's somewhere online um, um, that talks about how all that works. And so there are existing treaties and existing law that spacefaring nations have all um, you know, work together and agreed to. So yes, that is out there. Um, yes, if you wanna share the presentation, I'll actually, um, I'll put a link of, of the whole entire presentation in the, um, in the chat uh, whenever I get a brain break and, and can kind of multitask. But yeah, I would love to share it. It's um, everything in here is available for you to use. And if you're a teacher or if you wanna share um, with, um, with your family. There are some notes in the um, in this section underneath the slides with a few talking points. I try to keep them updated because as you can imagine, it changes all the time. Um, so if you ever want an updated version, that same link that I'll give you, um, I try to update it about every month if anything changes. Um, choo -choo -choo. All right, I'm looking good. glad to see that we're going back to the moon. Yep. Yes, it does make a lot more sense to go to the moon first than Mars. And I think that was always kind of NASA's plan. Um, and we just, uh, we, but we do what we're told by our government, right? We're, we're a government agency and our direction comes from the White House and our money is approved and given to us by Congress. So if you are a big space fan and you have an idea of how you feel the government you know, should use money, you know, that's what your your Congress uh, and your senators are for, you know, you write your congressman or email, I guess people don't really write as much anymore, but you email or call your Congress, um, congressman or congresswoman and let them know what's important to you. Because like I said, NASA gets a half of a percent of the federal budget and we do more with our money. You get a greater return and in investment in the space program than any other um, government agency. So there's a lot of great things that come from the space program. There's a whole website about it. It's called spinoffs, NASA spinoffs. And it's a uh, that we put a PDF, um, pretty much like a magazine or a huge document every year listing all of the new spec technology transfers that came from that particular year from um, all the work that NASA does with um, internally just from the government and then also with industry and our international partners. All right, any other questions? You guys are asking great questions so far. All right, do you, do you know what kinds of experiments will be done while on the moon? I can tell you that there are uh, the scientists have a whole long list of experiments they want astronauts to do. Um, and I've, we have asked the same question to one of our planetary scientists and our geologists who have done a few events with me. And she says, we just don't know which ones the astronauts will have time to do because the main focus of the mission is of course getting the astronauts there, proving that we can live on the surface of the moon and getting um, the uh, technology and all of our systems working and, and, and proven that, that they could then use, be used on Mars. And science, I wouldn't say science is secondary because there's a lot of science that we will be doing, but they have to make sure and they work it in um, and that it's a, an important larger piece of the mission. So it benefits the whole, the whole goal of the mission. So I know some of the science, will, a lot of it will be around water. And that fits along with the human element of space too, because you need water to survive. So you can, how are you gonna extract that water deep inside those caves? Or, or I'm sorry, not caves, craters. Um, we'll have different robotics, you know, vehicles that maybe could go down there. Astronauts aren't gonna, you know, um, zip line or, you know, go down there on, on a pulley or rope system, that's not safe. And so robot, robots will have to go down into those craters. And then once you extract the water, it's going to be gross. It's going to be mixed with all that volcanic rock and we call it regolith of the moon. So how are you going to clean it up? We have different machines that we've been working on that we hope that we can, you know, scrub it and, and have, you know, clean drinking water and then water that we can use for propulsion, turn that at H2O and separate it and you have your liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen we could use for a propulsion system. 
And then also a water, a air we could breathe. So that's a, um, how science and the, the human operation side of things kind of meet. Um, they'll probably also put telescopes. I know that they're gonna be a lot of sample returns, um, taking samples and understanding that part of the moon and understanding that earth moon relationship and how the moon came to be and our place in the solar system. Um, we haven't, I know they're working on the main science objectives um, and, and to get an approved list of the ones that will be for those first few missions, but I haven't, they haven't released those yet. So those are, are to come. All right. YMCA, trying to get girls interested in STEM. Have you done any presentations to the YMCA? So I have, I haven't done any um, in your area, but if you'd like to book me, I'm free. <laughs> your taxpayer dollars pay for my time. Um, but yeah, I would, I would love to, um, I'd love to connect with you. So one thing I can do without thinking too much is put my email in here. And so you can reach out to me. And if any of the rest of you have any kind of um, outreach engagement that you'd like us to consider, um, I can't say yes to everything, but if, if my schedule allows for it, I'm, I would love to help and support. So moon mining, we will be using the moon resources to help us survive on the moon. So um, can we turn the regolith into some sort of brick or, you know, you know, um, some type of solid that we could build a habitat structure out of. That's something that we're interested in looking into. Um, as far as companies like staking claim to an area of the moon and mining it, it is so expensive and hard to get to the moon. I don't think that's going to happen at all anytime soon, but those are all parts of that, you know, agreement that was created when, you know, in that, I think like in the seventies or eighties when we, when we went to the moon. Um, and so we'd, ha I'd have to check that out to see exactly what the wording would be, but no moon mining is going to happen for, for, um, for profit anytime soon, because getting to the moon is so expensive and getting all those materials back would be so expensive. I don't know if it would be worth the return on their investment right now until uh, traveling in space becomes easier. Can you compare the size of the moon to something to give us some idea of how much of the moon we will see or have seen? So, you know, we only see one side of the moon. We're locked in, in, as, in our orbits. And so our planet re uh, rotates and the moon also rotates. We just are rotating at the same time and we don't ever see the far side of the moon. Um, it's not the dark side of the moon, it's the far side of the moon. Um, and so there's a whole other body that we haven't seen. Um, as far as size, the moon is about one sixth the size of Earth. So it would take six moons to fit um, in Earth. And that's, I guess that's the best way I could kind of describe the difference in, in sizes. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um, I'll have to come up with, see if I can come up with some better ways to compare like one side of the moon is like, what, like the country of the United States or Russia. I think that's kind of the answer that you want. And I don't know, that's a, but that's a good thing for me to learn and to figure out. That'd be a great way of explaining it. Let's see, will any animals go along when we go to the moon? So at first, I imagine the answer is no, but later on, um, as our science capability grows, I would say yes. So we have animals on the space station often. Um, they're very, very small animals. We've had worms and spiders and bees. Oh, that was on the space shuttle. Um, we've had butterflies, we've had mice. Um, and so very, gnats, I think some flies or whatever. So really small insects. And, and then I think um, the mice have been the smallest or at least the only mammal that I'm aware of that has been to the space station. I believe the astronauts brought a frog on the space shuttle and maybe a fish. There, there were a few other animals that flew on the space shuttle programs. Um, but once we get um, operationally sound, I guess is the best way to put it, once we everything is working, we have all of our new technology and capability in place for our people, then I think then there are, their science capability will grow. So it wouldn't surprise me one bit that we bring mice or other small mammals um, and insects to the moon. Um, Cause understanding how they adapt to um, a different gravity environment is really, really helpful. And we've learned a lot um, just with having um, animals and insects on the space station. Um, gravity, yes, gravity is also a sixth. Very good, you got it, Keith, you're right. Um, so Corey says, I meant what's, what size wise percentage of the moon will, will space exploration see? Oh, so like what percentage are we planning missions to? Um, I think is what your question is. So right now, South Pole, but um, the great thing about 
um, gateway is it's in a um, halo rectilinear orbit, which is like a, kind of like a polar orbit or a, it's kind of off to the side, kind of a, it's called a halo orbit. And, but that allows us as the moon rotates, um, we will gain access to all points of the moon. So um, if we time it right and wait until the right moment, we could land on the North Pole, the South Pole, anywhere along the equator or anywhere anywhere else. Um, but for now, the focus is the South Pole. Um, and then once we establish a base there, then sure, why why wouldn't we want to explore other areas? But um, but getting to space is really hard and really expensive. And so the South Pole will be probably our main focus for, for I would imagine, the next 20 years or so. Um, and then we'll see what, what we can do from there. I'd love it to be like, you know, The Expanse or one of those really cool sci-fi shows. I don't know if you've seen that. That's one of my favorites. Um, and how easy it is to just travel around in space um, and be able to go, you know, to the belt or to go to Mars or to go to the moon. It's, you know, you just buy a ticket just like you would on an airplane to go um, in space. And I definitely don't think I will see that in my lifetime. But, and, and maybe not even in my kid's lifetime, but maybe my grandkid's lifetime, maybe that's, you know, maybe going to the moon will be more affordable for people then. We'll see. So I'm guessing that the South Pole just looks better than the North Pole for water and craters. Yes, that's the main reason we're going to the South Pole is because of the amount of water ice there and how we believe it will be um, more easily, uh, easily accessible to us um, on the South Pole. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I love um, what you said about how we will have access to all parts of the moon. And that's really, it's really important about Gateway. And um, people sometimes like to compare it to Space Station because it's really hard. Like, what else are you going to compare it to? And so that's why we NASA likes to call it an outpost or an orbiting platform because it's not really a space station because our space station has the volume of a five bedroom home. I mean, that's how much space it is. Astronauts have so much space in space on the space station. And the gateway is tiny, is super small. Um, I don't know if it'll ever grow to the point of being as large as a space station. It's not needed right now. So that's why we're not advocating and, and requesting funding for a giant space station. We have a great science, science laboratory and orbit around the Earth. This gateway is more as a waypoint between missions from the orbit around the moon to the surface of the moon. So yes, Sherry, is radiation a danger to our astronauts? Yes. As soon as we leave the, um, the magnetosphere of the Earth, astronauts are bombarded with a much higher dose of radiation than they are on the space station. So they do get more radiation on the space station than on Earth, but not a, a, a huge amount, right? Because um, they're still within the magnetosphere. But when we leave that and we go to Mars, there's no protection, there's no barrier. And there's no magic shielding or hole that protects astronauts from radiation. We, we can't build, there's, there's just no material that can, that, that can withstand those tiny, tiny, tiny little particles, microscopic tar particles that can go through just about any surface. Um, really the best thing that protects us from radiation is water. And so right now what they tell our astronauts to do and what they're training for is inside of Orion, we also have uh, water bags. Um, and what we will do if we know that there is a solar flare and an increase of radiation coming towards our spacecrafts, then astronauts will basically pile water, um, water bags and materials on top of them and get down into the bottom of the spacecraft and try to put as many layers of materials between them and, um, and the radiation particles. Um, there's also some really cool ideas. These are just concepts, we're not building it, but ideas of for when we do go to Mars, putting water as a barrier in between um, the outs or in between the outside part of the spacecraft and then the inside. So in that middle layer, um, having a circulating water barrier um, in our spacecraft and our habitats to protect from radiation. So that's one of the cool ideas I've heard. But it's a huge deal. Um, it's it could be it could be it could be deadly. So our astronauts might be able to withstand and live through the radiation during our trips, but when they come back, they could have a, a much higher risk for cancer or even other illnesses. Ha, are there any secret uh, lunar bases that I can tell you about? Well, we haven't been to the moon since 1972. And that is the absolute truth. Um, you can you can look at all the, the federal budgets and what NASA has been has received over the years. And the moon has not been a priority until recently. Um, after the Apollo missions, you know, having um, 
having an in-space um, space station in orbit around the Earth was super important. And so that's why the space shuttle was around. It was like the workhorse, the big moving van to help build the space station over that 10 or so year process. And then once the space station was finished, we didn't need a giant space shuttle to take astronauts back and forth. And so we that was when NASA um, purchased services from the Russians while American companies like SpaceX and others were and Boeing and, and even North, um, let's say Sierra Nevada, Blue Origin, all these um, newer space companies were developing capabilities to get humans into space. So NASA's invested a lot of money um, in government contracts to help grow um, some of these companies and get them to the point so that now they can take our astronauts to the space station. So NASA contracts and buys a service from SpaceX. And we'll have our next um, launch with Crew 2 in just a few weeks. I think it's on the 25th or 26th of April, we're launching another crew of astronauts in the SpaceX Dragon to the space station. Yeah, but no lunar bases, no secret ones anyways. At least I don't know about. <laughs> Any other questions? We're almost at the hour, so this would be a great chance to ask any last burning questions before we go. And while you guys are doing that, I'm going to get that link to the presentation. Um, so uh, just give me a minute and I'll give you guys a minute to, um, to see if you have any other questions you wanna ask while I'm doing that. I have to log into the system, so I'll need a second. All right, I don't see any more questions. Oh, that's not right. This program, here we go, share. All right, so here is the link to the presentation. I call this our, our Artemis baseline outreach presentation. And, and you're free to use that in your classrooms. Um, if you're working with any groups of students or adults um, and you wanna share some of the pictures and videos, they're all there. Yeah, so that is it for me. Um, you got one more chance to ask questions before we go, but I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Um, oh, here we go. Beatrice has one. You get the last question. Um, Beatrice asks, the Earth has a lot of water and it recycles what happens on the moon. We don't know the answer to that. And so that's um, what we, um, when that um, chart, one of those first charts that I showed you that we want to understand the volatile cycles of the moon, that's, that's the water cycle. We want to understand the water cycle of the moon because we have no idea. So that's a great question. Something our scientists want to know as well. All right, Mary, I'll turn it over to you. Patricia, I wanna thank you so much for that extremely informative program. You have single-handedly reignited my interest in our space program. It's been a while, it's kind of been off my radar and probably the radar of many people. And it's just, it's really against everything that's been being undertaken. And thank you so much. You're very welcome. Very welcome. And um, we will pa we will pass the word. Uh, we'll pass the link along um, to whoever is interested. Anna, do you have any closing?